Okay. All right. So, um, hi, everyone. Welcome to another Brains at Bay. I'm Charmaine. I work in Amenta and I'm the organizer for this event. So for our new members, also welcome. We're an online brain-inspired machine learning meetup with the goal of fostering the study and development of machine learning algorithms heavily inspired by neuroscience research. So today we're gonna to be talking about how the principles of neuromodulators in the brain can lead to more flexible and robust machine learning systems. And we're super thrilled to have three great speakers with us. We have Dr. Shrikant Ramazwamy from Newcastle University, Dr. Dieme from the Brain and Mind Institute, and also Do Dr. Thomas McConey from ML Collective. Um, if you're interested in watching one of our previous meetups or you have to leave early today, we do record all of our sessions and we'll post them on Nementa's YouTube channel. And I usually post them within like a day or two. And after I post this uh, today's meetup recording, I'll also post the link to the meetup page. And if you have any feedback or suggestions, just feel free to message me through the meetup page or you can message me with the email below. So before we officially start, if you have any questions for the speaker, please ask them using this Q&A feature on Zoom. It might look a little different here since I have like the host view, but then you'll see the little icon underneath in the Zoom toolbar. And for uh, and there you can ask your questions or you can also vote on existing questions if you like the questions. We'll try to address all the questions um, after each talk, but I think most of them will likely be discussed towards the um, end in the discussion panel. And if time allows, I'll invite members to ask their questions live. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Sri Khan from Azami. So Sri directs the NeuroCircuits Laboratory at Newcastle University, which focuses on understanding how neuromodulators shape learning and cognition in neurocortical circuits. He was formerly a group leader in the Blue Brain Project at the Federal Institute of Technology, which he led the effort in modeling synaptic transition and neuromodulation in the brain. Um, Sri, Sri and May recently collabed on a review that focuses on how the principles of neuromodula uh, neuromodulation might benefit deep learning networks, which is what we'll be talking about today. So I'm also happy to introduce um, Subutai, who is Nementa's VP of Research and Engineering as a moderator for this meetup and discussion panel. So Subutai, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I'm really thrilled to act as moderator here uh, of the session on neuromodulators and AI. I'm really thrilled to have the three of you, Sri, May, and Thomas here. I think uh, this is the perfect trio to discuss this topic. I myself don't know a lot about neuromodulators, so uh, you know, reading the review paper that you guys wrote was really impactful to me. And uh, you know, I'll have questions and and you know, try to moderate some of the questions uh, that come up as well. So, without uh, further ado, uh, do you want to get started, Srikant? Okay. Right. So, so thanks, uh, uh, Charmaine and uh, and Subutai for uh, this invitation. Uh, it's uh, great to be here um, and uh, to talk about uh, how neuromodulators. Uh, might impact uh, AI. Uh, so um, the first part of uh, uh, today's meetup, uh, I'll, I'll try and focus a bit um, on on the biology of neuromodulatory systems. So I I decided to uh, to kind of put together a little primer um, to uh, to to provide an introduction on on neuromodulatory systems. Uh, so um, let's start with a with a little uh, motivation on the, the synaptic brain, as I like to call it. Uh, so um, the, the human brain consists of about uh, 86 billion neurons that are connected by about um, 100 uh, trillion synapses, so 10 to the 12 synapses. Um, and um, to, to, to make these numbers a, a, a little more complicated, uh, or, or this whole affair uh, more complex, um, these neurons and synapses are, are continuously being act, acted upon by certain signaling chemicals called uh, neuromodulators um, that, that uh, uh, really uh, dynamically um, reconfigure uh, or change activity states of neurons and, and synapses um, to, to bring about um, myriads um, of possibilities at the, at the network level. Um, so what are these um, neuromodulators or, or what is neuromodulation? 
Um, so, of course, there's also another definition of neuromodulation that's clinical, but I'm going to talk about, or rather the focus of today's uh, meetup is, is on, uh, on neuromodulatory systems, um, which um, are, are physiological processes um, by which a given neuron uh, uses one or more neurotransmitters or chemicals to regulate diverse populations of neurons. So uh, neuromodulators are, are, are uh, collectively neurotransmitters or neuropeptides or hormones. So signaling chemicals um, that have some kind of spatial distribution um, uh, across um, uh, many, many, many different brain regions. Uh, in addition, they also have temporarily extended effects on target neurons, synapses, and microcircuits in different brain regions. Uh, so uh, this is a, a little cartoon of the, of the human brain um, uh, that actually describes um, the various subcortical neuromodulatory projections. Subcortical because the, the topmost part in this cartoon is actually the cerebral cortex. Um, and most of these neuromodulatory nuclei are actually located below the cerebral cortex. Therefore, they're subcortical structures. Um, and they, they, they really emanate from uh, deep down in the brain and project all around um, the brain, including the cerebral cortex, which is very richly innovated by these uh, neuromodulatory projections. Um, so um, there are five major ascending neuromodulatory systems um, ascending simply because um, there are neurons that release certain neuromodulators homed in, in, uh, in the subcortical regions. Uh, and they have these very long range axons that, that really climb up and project um, across the brain. Um, so uh, include, including the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus and, and virtually any, any brain region. So these axons just ascend from these neuromodulatory nuclei and really project all over the brain. So the, I like to call these the big five neuromodulators. Uh, so acetylcholine, um, uh, so cholinergic neurons are mainly uh, housed in the basal forebrain um, or the septal nucleus of the hippocampus or the so-called pedunculopontine um, nuclei. Dopamine, um, the so-called pleasure molecule, um, that we've all heard about. Um, uh, dopamine um, um, is released from neurons uh, in, in, a, in an area called nucleus accumbens or, or the striatum, um, the ventral tegmental area, or even the substantia nigra. So serotonin um, is released from um, a neurons in the so-called dorsal raphe nucleus. Norepinephrine is released from the locus ceruleus. Uh, and histamine that's not in this cartoon is actually released um, uh, from a little nucleus called the tuberomammillary nucleus that's probably located somewhere here. So there are five uh, big um, neuromodulatory systems that, that project from subcortical regions all the way uh, uh, to um, uh, the cortex and, 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 and many other brain regions. Um, so uh, to, to give you a, a, a little idea for uh, uh, what these neuromodulators do and, 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 and how they, they act on different neurons. Uh, so let's consider the, the cerebral cortex, right? Which is, which as I said, sits um, on, on, on the very top of the brain, right? It's, it's like, like the outer bark uh, of a tree, right? Um, so uh, a, a tiny crumb of the cerebral cortex, which is roughly, um, the size of a grain of sand or a pinhead consists of about uh, 30,000 neurons. And these 30,000 neurons could be uh, further classified into 55 morphological types. It's something like um, the, the diversity of flora in the Amazonia, right? So, so depending on, on, the, on the shapes of axons um, that are actually shown in blue and dendrites that are actually shown in red, there are about 55 different morphological types in a tiny crumb of the cerebral cortex, and they're arranged in a laminar fashion. Um, so they're actually arranged um, uh, in layers, layer one being the most superficial and layer six being uh, the, the deepest. 
And there are all kinds of neurons. So, so layer one mostly consists uh, of interneurons that release a certain chemical called GABA. Whereas um, um, as we proceed uh, or, or try and navigate uh, deeper and deeper into the cortex, um, uh, one encounters pyramidal cells that, that are excitatory and that release a chemical called glutamate. Uh, and, and of course, all other uh, interneurons. Uh, so, um, so in this little crumb of the cortex, all these uh, neurons are, are constantly interacting with one another, right? It's a little ecosystem, as I said, like the Amazonia. So they're always communicating with one another. So assuming that, um, that uh, all 55 types communicate with, with the rest, so combinatorially, this is 55 squared or 3025 potential synaptic connection combinations. Um, but we know by, by virtue of, of um, 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 the geometry of axons and dendrites um, that this 3025 uh, combinations of synaptic connections is not uh, geometrically viable. So there are about um, 2000 or so that are geometrically viable. And experimentally, we only know um, uh, the, the physiology or the function of um, these 2000 or so synaptic combinations, um, we only know um, uh, the physiology of about 20, that's roughly 1%. Um, and, um, the, and, and this becomes even more complicated to try and understand uh, the function of a single neuromodulator like acetylcholine, which is probably the most exhaustively studied neuromodulator in the cortex. Um, so the, the, the idea I'm trying to convey here um, is that uh, there's a huge diversity of neurons in, in any part of the brain. Um, and um, uh, these neurons interact with others um, uh, through, through synapses. And neuromodulators like acetylcholine or dopamine or serotonin or whatever act upon um, um, these neurons, change their uh, firing properties, also act on, on their synaptic connections change synaptic weights uh, and time constants of, of synaptic function and things like that. Um, uh, and and uh, depending on, on, on where the synapses are formed uh, spatially um, and, and uh, the effects temporally, um, uh, neuromodulators could, could really have very, very uh, pronounced uh, impact on uh, the function of neurons and their synaptic connections. Um, and we're only beginning to appreciate this complexity. Uh, we're certainly nowhere there yet. Um, I would say we're, we're still at the tip of the iceberg, like skimming the surface. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done uh, to really try and understand how these neuromodulators impact neuronal and synaptic function. Um, so just to give you another um, idea um, of the, the so-called diversity of neurotransmitters, so I already mentioned glutamate and, and GABA and these other neuromodulators, acetylcholine, noradrenaline, serotonin, dopamine, and histamine. So um, they uh, act um, uh, through specific receptors uh, that are mostly distributed on the dendrites and possibly also the axons of, of these uh, 55 neuron types, let's say. I mean, just, just to, to, uh, to keep things tractable. So if, if, the, if the neuromodulators um, uh, or, or neurotransmitters could be considered um, the key, the locks could be these different receptors. So the, um, the keys only open specific locks. And once the lock and key combination is set, only then is the gate opened for something to happen to a neuron, right? So depending on the kind of receptors, um, which could be broadly categorized as inotropic or metabotropic, uh, which uh, really um, is based on the time scales of, of their physiology or their function. So inotropic receptors have um, very fast time scales of operation uh, in the order of uh, a few to, to tens of milliseconds, whereas metabotropic receptors are much slower in their operation. So they they, they uh, tend to operate in the range of hundreds of, of milliseconds, right? So, so depending on the neuromodulator, the receptor type, uh, and the kinetics of the, of the receptors, um, there could be very marked effects um, um, uh, at the neuronal, uh, the synaptic, or the network level. Um, so, so this is another little cartoon that I um, uh, um, made to, to, 
to just highlight the, the vast diversity of receptors, um, neuromodulatory receptors that are found in cortical neurons. So along the y-axis are uh, many different neuron types, like pyramidal cells across different layers or interneurons across different layers. And along the x-axis here um, are, are the different uh, neuromodulatory receptors um, um, belonging to acetylcholine or noradrenaline or serotonin or dopamine or histamine. So what this map is trying to show is, is, is the correlation of receptor expression. Um, and and um, something like, like this uh, makes it a lot more tractable to, uh, to try and understand this combinatorial explosion of what receptor types are expressed in, in what neurons and is it necessary to really measure all of their physiology or by just looking at, at um, uh, the co-expression of receptors uh, uh, and, and this matrix that seems to predict that if one receptor type is expressed, then what's the probability of another receptor type belonging to another neuromodulator? So what, what's the chance that it's expressed? And looking at this, we could somehow make this whole problem of mapping the physiology of neuromodulatory function uh, a lot more tractable. So um, uh, this is a, a very broad overview of, of some salient functions of neuromodulators, um, like serotonin that projects from the raphe nucleus uh, to part of the cortex um, uh, seems to, uh, to, to really uh, play an important role in stress assessment. Um, or, or the so-called um, um, paradigm of fight or flight, uh, for example, whereas um, uh, acetylcholine that's released um, uh, from the basal forebrain um, uh, in the neocortex, uh, for example, uh, seems to encode attention, right? So uh, our ability to concentrate, our ability to focus on something, our ability to stay attentive. So all this seems to... Um, uh, be regulated by uh, acetylcholine and its projections to the cortex, for example. Um, whereas norepinephrine um, uh, that projects from the locus ceruleus pretty much all over the brain uh, seems to encode uh, uh, a novelty and saliency of stimuli. Uh, and uh, dopamine, of course, um, uh, seems to encode reward prediction and motivation uh, and, and such behavioral states. Um, so um, um, I, I wanted to reinforce this, this message again, that um, neuromodulatory systems uh, actually act spatially and temporally across neurons, for example, in the cerebral cortex <coughs> to actually regulate uh, cortical states um, or, or network activity or network transitions in the cortex. And to me, this is like a relay race where one neuromodulator sets the stage for another neuromodulator to take over. And this is a constant process that's ongoing as long as, as an organism is alive, right? So the baton is always constantly being passed to bring about these changes um, in, in brain states or depending on, on, on the brain region, for example, the cortex, cortical states. Um, and it's, it's really like a game of dice um, that operates on certain parts uh, of, of neurons across certain timescales. And the spatio-temporal combination of neuromodulatory function is what makes them uh, uh, so unique. Um, and of course, um, uh, as I said, these neuromodulators act across different levels of organization, uh, all the way from ion channels that are expressed on dendrites of neurons to modifying the structure of neurons, for example, uh, introducing or removing, or removing dendritic spines um, or, or uh, changing the firing rate of neurons, uh, changing how neurons are connected. And ultimately all these changes, all, uh, all these multi-scale effects of neuromodulators come together to, to do something at the, at the network level, right? Uh, so again, to give you some more examples, um, uh, the functions of neuromodulators are multi-scale. So they could impact synaptic plasticity, they could impact uh, network oscillations, they could impact uh, the growth of uh, neurons. So um, uh, like, for example, acetylcholine in a brain region called the hippocampus that's responsible for learning and memory um, plays salient roles um, in, 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 in modulating all these levels of organization. Um, and this is a, another a little table to, to try and, and drive home the fact um, that um, this lock and key combination is very important 
and depending on the kind of receptor type that's activated and where they're distributed, um, a neuromodulator like acetylcholine can have really a, a potpourri of effects in the, in the hippocampus. Um, so uh, an, an important uh, function of neuromodulators is their role in synaptic plasticity. Of course, we all know um, Hebb's famous postulate um, that um, uh, when an axon of, of, a, of a neuron A comes close to uh, uh, the dendrites of neuron B, um, um, then if neuron A fires um, and neuron A and B are connected, then neuron uh, the, the synaptic connection between neuron A and B is strengthened. Uh, so the so-called use it or lose it or cells that fire together, wire together um, uh, paradigm. Um, uh, so neuromodulators uh, actually can um, regulate this window of plasticity induction. Uh, so spike timing dependent plasticity, which is um, mostly considered a physiological relevant form of Hebbian learning, uh, right? Uh, but uh, depending on, on, on the neuromodulator that's acting um, on, a, on, a, on a certain pair of neurons in a brain region, um, the, the, the uh, window for induction of spike timing dependent plasticity can be vastly, vastly regulated. For example, here, this is the, the famous STDP window um, between neurons in the hippocampus. And in black is the so-called control condition um, um, where um, if a presynaptic cell fires before a postsynaptic cell, uh, then there's potentiation. Um, and if it fires after, then there's depression. But um, if you add dopamine uh, into the bath while doing these experiments, then that's really going to modify this time window uh, for the induction of, of uh, STDP. Not just dopamine, um, pretty much every neuromodulator would do that depending on, on um, what brain region it's acting on. Um, and this is um, finally uh, an example of, of, a, of a relatively understudied neuromodulator histamine and what it can do um, to neurons in the hippocampus um, so in the plain vanilla case, um, uh, pyramidal cells don't fire as much in the hippocampus, um, uh, also fast spiking into neurons, but adding histamine um, to the bath actually enhances their firing rate. Um, and um, uh, adding histamine uh, to the bath also actually um, uh, fine tunes or sharpens the power spectrum of network oscillations. So um, here uh, in this study, uh, histamine was found to actually sharpen um, network oscillations in the so-called gamma band. These are high frequency network oscillations that are believed to be a direct readout of attention, learning, and memory. So it seems that neuromodulators like histamine could actually impact learning and memory by modulating gamma oscillations um, through regulating firing rates of neurons. Um, so some um, 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 conclusions here. Uh, on the functional diversity of neuromodulators. So the same neuron can be targeted by multiple neuromodulators. And depending on the kind of neuromodulator and the receptor type that's targeted, the effects can be completely different. So neuromodulators can produce qualitative changes in the intrinsic properties of neurons. For example, transform a tonic firing neuron into a phasic bursting neuron. A tonic firing neuron um, could be a neuron that's firing action potentials at a very high frequency. And adding a certain neuromodulator could completely change the identity of this neuron, like change um, um, uh, uh, Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde, uh, uh, convert a, 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 a neuron that's tonically fighting into a, a neuron that's physically fighting, so reduce the firing frequency um, of action potentials. And the same neuromodulators within a network can differentially regulate cell types and their synaptic connections. So depending on the cell type, again, uh, the very same neuromodulator can have um, uh, very, very different effects. Um, so some take-home organizing principles of neuromodulators. So most neuromodulatory systems project from subcortical regions. They release um, neuromodulators um, from a certain loci, um, subcortical loci that broadcast to larger areas within the brainstem, thalamus, or the cortex. So um, um, neuromodulatory systems are, are reciprocally connected with the frontal cortex and parts of the limbic system um, that actually regulates behavioral and emotional responses. So whenever we feel happy or feel, we feel low, any behavioral or emotional change is always due to 
um, the function of, of uh, a certain neuromodulator. And lo and behold, neuromodulators don't uh, uh, ever act in isolation. So they always function in cooperation or opposition to bring about these changes in brain state. So this relay race um, example is very important to keep in mind because neuromodulators never function in isolation. They always set the stage for some other neuromodulator or combinations to, to take over. So with, with that, um, I'll, I'll conclude my little primer um, on um, um, neuromodulators and their effects on cell synapses and microcircuits across different brain regions. Thank you, Srikant. That was fantastic. That was a great overview. Um, we have a couple of quick questions on the, uh, on the Q&A. Maybe we can ask that. Uh, so we actually have two Siddharths, <laughs> two different Siddharths here. So first Siddharth, uh, what, what's the latency on the effects of the neuromodulators relative to neuron firings? And I think you touched on that a little bit, but maybe you can expand. Right, so the latency um, really depends on, on um, the combination of receptors that are activated. So if um, a certain neuromodulator only activates inotropic receptors, then this latency is going to be in the order of a few milliseconds. But if metabotropic receptors are involved, then this latency is really going to be in the order of tens or hundreds of milliseconds. So it depends on the kind of receptors that are activated and where they are spatially located, for example, on the dendrites. If receptors are, 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 are located on distal dendrites, then of course, there's going to be a longer latency but if they are located more proximally, then the latency is going to be shorter. Yeah, so that's actually a question I had. So there are actually differential effects depending on where in the dendritic tree or whether it's close to the soma and, and stuff. So um, interesting. Um, and so, let's um, so would I, if I can interrupt a bit, of, I think your question is quite interesting to take a look at uh, Alan Des text work because he really studied, um, you know, like how this um, a synaptic contact, the location can affect the fairy of the cell and the computational rules. And he actually has a really interesting case of uh, he reduced around 200 different compartments into three and having kind of comparable functions. And I think I can share the link to that paper. And uh, I think based on your recent research on dendritic computing, that's quite in, that's a quite interesting read to look at. Yeah. 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 This is something we're we're quite interested in, and in, in the impacts of plastic how plasticity works in different parts of the dendritic tree as yeah. well could be. Indeed. Um, right. I mean, there there are there are all these nonlinearities and and that are distributed in whatever way, and so where these receptors are based on dendrites, of course, um, makes um, a lot of difference. Yeah. Um, in, in dictating um, the, uh, the eventual properties of the neuron. But another thing that I didn't touch upon here is, is neuromodulatory release um, uh, mainly happens through two modalities, right? It's not always synaptic, but uh, this um, a broadcast release of neuromodulators could also happen through something called volume transmission, right? Where um, these long range axons project to a certain part of the brain, but they don't necessarily selectively target um, parts of the dendrites of some neuron, but they choose to like, like really impartially spray or spritz neuromodulator um, um, that, that could then uh, propagate to all dendrites or axons or whatever neurites there are in the vicinity of, of this neuromodulatory projection. Um, so um, the, the effects or the latency would also depend on the modality of release. Um, right, right. So it's, it's, it's not just a receptor type or where these receptors are based, but also the modality of release. And in addition to this, I think uh, one interesting example um, people can take a look in at is uh, the uh, subthalamic part and also like the, the thalam different thalamic compartments. For example, if you have the like one uh, really great example is uh, the release cell in the thalamus, uh, for example, in the vision part of it. And um, uh, in, in the release cell and the interneurons within the thalamus, there are different ways that are, you know, the, the neurons are, are, are contacting each other. For example, there are like uh, uh, active uh, synaptic contacts at the more proximal part of the release cell. And uh, the interneurons, on the contrary, they kind of contact the distal part or medial part of the cell. So there are some really great yeah. examples of that. Yeah. Hmm. 
Let's take one more question and then the rest maybe we can mm -hmm. handle in the discussion. Um, I think you, uh, this is more about the contextual impacts of, um, of neuromodulators. And uh, I think you touched on this a little bit in the review paper, but the question here is, are neuro neuromodulators applied based on some sensory input like fear or arousal? Are there neuromodulators that are constantly active regardless of any uh, sensory input? Uh, for so example- the Contextual uh, you know, impact here. Uh, right. So there are neuromodulators that are um, um, uh, active regardless of sensory input. For example, um, um, histamine, right? So um, the, the histaminergic system uh, is turned on the moment we are awake um, and, and continues to remain turned on um, even when we are asleep but possibly with decreased levels of histaminergic release. Uh, and this is regardless of sensory stimulus. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, uh, there are other neuromodulators that uh, depend on a brain state and the behavioral paradigm um, where, uh, for example, um, yes, fear learning, uh, right? Um, so um, there, um, neuromodulators, um, uh, including acetylcholine or dopamine or even serotonin, would play uh, very distinct roles in regulating uh, fear conditioning. Um, so depending on the brain state and the kind of sensory stimuli that's received, yes, certain neuromodulators could be more active than others. And there are also certain neuromodulators that are constantly active uh, regardless of, of sensory stimuli. Um, which is again why I think the interaction uh, between these neuromodulators is so fundamentally important um, because uh, they really set the stage and they provide mm -hmm. like a platform um, or the foundation uh, for other neuromodulators to, to kick in. Um, and, and therefore, um, this whole idea of co-release and co-transmission of neuromodulators is, is very important in, in my opinion. Um, but this is not, this is something that's, that's certainly not, not easy to study. Um, because although we say that, okay, um, dopamine is involved in reward or, 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 or serotonin or noradrenaline is involved in fear conditioning, um, we're only looking at one neuromodulator, but that doesn't mean that others aren't involved. It's just that uh, we have no way of, of simultaneously monitoring multiple neuromodulators at once. Uh, although um, there is some progress being made there, but uh, hmm. um, I think uh, the, the day we are able to monitor multiple neuromodulators simultaneously is when will be a game changer. Yeah, yeah, opinion. I can imagine. Yes, I think that answers Andrew's question on the, on the Q&A as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, shall we move on to uh, May's talk? Okay, yeah. so if we are moving on, I can share my screen, I can share my presentation. There we go. And uh, yeah, let me just quickly introduce you. So okay. um, May is a postdoc <laughs> at the Brains and My Institute from University of Western Ontario with a PhD in medical neuroscience, May brings together her deep learning and neuroscience expertise to make machines smarter. And she's also written extensively um, extensive publications in both fields. She's also the first author of the review paper we're looking at today, and we're really happy to have you here. Thank you for the for introducing me, and um, I guess I'm going to take over Sheree's stage uh, because this is something that we want to see, like, uh, actually I saw some questions that are related that, that I can answer using my presentation, and so I was not like, uh, yeah, but I, I want to leave it for later. And uh, so my talk is actually two, three parts uh, because I wanted to introduce the framework first and then some of the results we are obtaining from it. So my talk is about implementing modest scale neural modulation in artificial neural networks. And uh, you have all well know me now. And uh, this study is uh, sponsored by, um, sorry, is sponsored by the Brain and Mind Institute of Esther, um, as well as the Brain Scan Initiative and the Computer Science Department. So here we're going to discuss how we can implement multi-scale neuromodulation in, in AANs and the results of having such a multi-scale neuromodulation. Okay, so um, the first thing I want to do is uh, just a review of a couple of studies that are 
in this related field. And um, we want to provide actually actually a direct comparison between your modulation in the nervous systems and that in the DNS. And we want to compare like the studies that focus on artificial modulation or use part of it to promote their you know, learning objectives. And we compare the tasks they have achieved and the implementation of uh, neural networks in these studies, as well as what they have observed. And um, after that, we wanted to discuss the proposal we have made, you know, in more detail. It's a multi-scale framework for new modulation in DNs and for more details, I read the paper. And I hope today I can give a really like uh, interesting primer on that and uh, like make you learn this, in a, you know, like in, in, in real and in some real details. And we wanted to add the spatial temporal specificities at different scales. And in the meantime, we want to present some improved results we have by implementing such a framework. And if I still have some time, I'm gonna just uh, give a one or two sentence introduction to current work we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are having and the relevance and what are the next steps of, uh, of, of this framework. So, um, okay, so all the figures, almost figures I'm presenting, they are already in our um, you know, paper already. So like for this, you can refer to the paper. I know this, there are a lot of details. And if you have any, any questions or, or confusions, just let me know. And uh, for all the other figures we have, they will be released in the preprint gonna submit during the month. Okay, so first we wanted to make sense. Uh, so what is a biological nervous system implementing the ways of neuromodulation and what have we done for deep neural networks? So um, Shri has already mentioned there are uh, spatial temporal scales affecting different you know, vicinities. And uh, I wanna take it over from here and actually describe some of the tasks we have achieved using such a multi-scale design. So both the temporal and spatial scale. So we can see that um, a neural modulation actually have an effect at, at a really local sub-neuronal level. For example, it can modify the internal kinetics. This is what acetylcholine does. And if you go a bit up, it also performs morphologic modification of dendrites. So this is a study published on science, and this is about the um, dopaminergic neurons that are that are you know modifying the, the shape of dendrite and affecting the few computational properties of these. Uh, neurons by modifying the dendrite. And, um, and at a really higher level, we can see that after an extended time temporal scale of up to months and days, we have more interestingly model learning and execution, reward processing, and social cognition, as well as attention also through, uh, throughout the longer period. And in the meantime, we also have many intermediate scales that are you know, affecting the synaptic plasticity of neurons or, or you know, microcircuits and um, uh, like in long or short term. And after that, we also have a functional reconfiguration of uh, neural networks or microcircuits in a more biological term. Um, and I think there are like a lot of experiments on this especially done by Imater. And um, she published a couple of papers on this about how if you have the neural same neural network applying different neural modulators by different kind of path, you can fundamentally change the output of the same neural network. So this is an interesting way we can kind of uh, mod modulate and modify the function of the same neural network. And this is how we are spanning across a temporal scale, spatial scale in biological nervous system by having neural modulators and having them kind of a guiding or modulating different tasks. And in the meantime, if you compare a bit of, um, you know, these are for the uh, first studies we have a bit of a to covered and discuss in our paper, uh, you know, but it's not, uh, it's not all inclusive. And there are some more studies in this field, of course, I think, but unfortunately not so many more. I think there are a couple of uh, two or three more papers coming out of this year. And uh, uh, we are choosing this for because these four represent uh, implementations of uh, for different tasks. And uh, you know they have also observed the different behavior benefits of uh, having new, new martial leaders involved in a deep neural networks. So, uh, but in the meantime, you can see that they're kind of colliding on the spatial scale. And as most of these studies, uh, they're covering a smaller spatial scale, and there's no like super tiny network or uh, you know like a, a really large network that are being tested. So, um, if we really discuss, you know, dissect the details of these papers, we can see that. Um, all these papers have achieved a lot of behavior benefits. For example, like for studies that are discussing, you know, how um, the agent is navigating better or more adaptively after neuromodulatory inputs, we can see that it have obtained higher rewards or being more adaptive. And in the meantime, uh, for the task involving uh, learning association between the input and the output, we have a uh, uh, neuromodulation enabling uh, learning of more patterns and associations. And in the meantime, we also have papers that are dedicated to alleviating catastrophic forgetting, a long-standing issue in, the, in continual learning using this uh, modularity-based neural network. 
And in the meantime, we, what we have already briefly covered is that the neural networks that have been implemented are like a, of, a, of a colliding spatial scale. For example, we have mostly these neural networks in these studies, they're relatively small. And uh, there's only one study by, actually by Miconi, our third speaker, you know, they're um, testing this uh, synaptic, you know, uh, neural modulation driven synaptic properties in a larger neural network uh, of, uh, uh, for, for language modeling. And in the meantime, what we can see is that these papers are using you know, modulatory properties of uh, deep neural networks or you know, kind of using this as a main objective investigation to achieve different goals. So for some of these, they wanted to see if we can improve the model performance by introducing these properties. And in some more, we wanted to understand if we have a sudden change of the you know, objectives or of the emulation goal in this field, uh, if uh, the neural modulation can help us be more adaptive. And in the meantime, we have all the other, other objectives, including, you know, in, enable state dependent behaviors, for example, like in a certain behavioral context, in a certain season uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a simulated year, if the agent will learn a different association between the environment and the food. So this is something we have been achieving using your modulation. We have seen like people really define your modulation in different ways and impl implement on different scales. For example, we may have uh, implementation of your modulation as uh, adjustments of, of uh, activation functions that are based on the internal external state of the environment and the, the agent itself. And in the meantime, we have a new modular factor scaling up to the whole network of subpopulations. So we can see that we are mostly implementing sorry, neural modulators in one local um, local context. And uh, that's why we are proposing such a framework. And we wanted to expand um, you know, this proposal of uh, biological nervous systems and their modul neural modulation to um, a scale that is of greater spatial temporal specificity and to see if we have a parallel you know, um, neural modulation ongoing uh, at, at different spatial scales if we can improve further the performance of neural network or help it learn. So this is a, this is objective of, uh, of us proposing, uh, proposing a multi-scale framework for, of neural modulation. And this is, um, yeah, this is actually, you can also find them in uh, our paper and with the more um, like uh, thorough description of what it does. But what I wanted to say is that this is the core of our proposal is a multi-scale artificial neural modulation unit. And what it does is that we divide this into four spatial scales. Of course, there are spatial scales in between of these, and these are just for um, you know, principal demonstration purposes and also to inspire people to think a bit more about the sp uh, spatial specificities of these. So we have them from um, uh, the whole network scale that are controlling the hyperparameter configuration, for example, the learning rate and dropout based on the, the input from the environment as well as the internal state of the, the agent. And in the meantime, if we have like a connectivity between neurons across different layers, what about if we have, you know, different kind of scaling and adjustments of connectivity by introducing like local or global plasticity. And uh, in the meantime, we can also see that for different neurons, um, you know, at a different uh, spatial scales or different layers, we may have neurons of different types by introducing you know, a uh, cell type specific neuromodulation onto these neurons. Um, uh, so one of the papers we have described the SUDA paper did that by having, you know, a, a, different, a different scaling factors of neuromodulation onto these neurons. And um, below that, we may also have different dendritic configuration for these neurons, depending on where they are. And I think some of the papers, for example, a subutized paper and the recent paper by uh, Blake Richards have also discussed how we can use this, um, you know, uh, dendritic properties of single neurons to achieve different computations, context-based learning, as well as error, error propagation. So this is our, you know, um, proposal regarding how we can inject different level of, uh, of neural modulation onto a deep neural network. And in the meantime, what I think that's important also is how we are studying it, how we are monitoring the effects of neural modulation and the performance of the neural network. So this is the next part of our talk. So first thing I wanted to highlight is that for this framework, we want to consider um, the internal and external state of the environment and also the agent. And we use these to you know, control the hyperparameter update and everything else in between. So for example, in, in animals, um, of course, in living organisms, we always observe from the environment at a certain at a certain sampling rate. And in the meantime, for the biological brain, we also have the internal copy or replicate of our current state, um, the cognitive state, behavioral state, and also you know, into internal properties of uh, the brain that we are not aware of. So this is some call, sometimes called um, the correlated discharge. And uh, 
So if we have this kind of uh, um, access to all these properties, we have a better knowledge of what the world is bringing us and what is our next action. And we can have a quite a contextual input based on these properties. So this is the first important feature we wanted to introduce in this framework. A second feature is that we may have a sample of model performance and behavior at a different spatial scale and temporal scale. So what's interesting about this is that, um, for example, for some certain animals or living organisms, the learning is a bit of, we all know the learning is continual um, and sometimes um, uh, not, uh, not symmetric because uh, for rodents, for example, when they're first introducing into, into, one, into one environment, they are more nervous and they're more like um, obsessive about exploring the surroundings to know if there's any hidden danger. So this is a state that are super alert and aware of the environmental surroundings. And then when they learn about uh, the surroundings a bit better and know how to avoid danger or obstacles. They, they are more relaxed and this is more uh, about the relaxed states. So of course, in uh, our brain, we also have different cognitive and behavioral states. Uh, we have more alert state, we have more attention state, and we have more relaxed state. So um, of course, at these different states, we are learning at different speeds and paces. So uh, what about if we study all of these different properties and of course for asymmetric paces of learning and we observe that how our brain or how the system optimized based on a local loss function. And then in the meantime, we monitor the global learning trajectory. We may have uh, kind of these going in asynchronous ways, but are interesting. We can see how we are uh, optimizing towards a local role. For example, a sudden change in the, in the, in the destination and um, a global uh, global goal, which is for example, obtaining a, a long, long, long sequence of rewards. So this is the second point I want to discuss. The third point is that we may have a task, task dependent evaluation of outcomes. For example, um, in the current study, we are using a spatial learning task. Um, of course, we are evaluating a lot of the, of the model. And in the meantime, we are evaluating, for example, the ambulation error, how the ambulatory track is deviating from the, the track that are, is actually uh, the ground truth. And uh, if we are looking into other tasks or other learning properties of the, the agent, for example, in a social cognition task. So if uh, repetitiveness with behave reciprocity of the behavior and the rewards obtained by the end. So these are something we are more focused on if you're switching from this task to a different task. So of course we are kind of a, a design of the things we want to observe or the metrics are really important because we may have in the future our task dependent evaluation of a neural network. We may also have a neural network that's suitable for learning from a set of tasks. So after incorporating all these scales of, uh, you know, of all these biological and spatial and gender scales, and as well as these new, you know, propo proposal regarding sampling of behavior and validation of uh, behavior outcome, we wanted to introduce you to some of our ongoing work at the lab about introducing neuro modulation of layer design at the network and connecting the levels, as well as, you know, learning or update all these parameters based on the current error. That's uh, our deviation from the environment. So, Let's get started. And our task, the task we use is navigation open field because navigation tasks is long studied and we also have a really biologically detailed understanding of how this works in, in different living organisms. For them, currently we are simulating after a uh, rodent's emulation trajectory uh, featuring, you know, featuring, continuous, um, uh, uh, featuring continuous exploration. And in the future, we also introduce another modeling organism that's uh, the primates and they're learning from different strategies, of course. And uh, so for this task, we wanted to estimate the current location of the, uh, the animal. And also, you know, we also want to know if, um, if our current uh, location, we estimate introduce a similar comparable activity of the cell types. So this study is partly inspired by the Benino et al. Uh, model published on Nature in 2018. Um, so in this model, we have uh, three different layers. So we have the recurrent layer, which is processing continuous input from the environment. So we have a starting location uh, where our agent is starting from. And in the meantime, we have access to its uh, direction and, and uh, direction of movement as well as velocity. And we are processing this using an LSTM module and across time. And then we um, input all of these, uh, we, we input this transformation into a dense layer uh, and then we have an up layer of two different types of neurons, uh, the place ensemble and head direction ensemble. And our goal of this task is to, pro is, uh, is to provide understanding of how, you know, based on the estimated location of the agent. So how the, the different cell types are faring. And the loss of this unit study is the difference between 
the place cell activity and hydrogen cell activity, the predict version and the actual version. So this is a task. And we are training the model for a total of a thousand epochs and we use a dropout, uh, also like a biologically intuitive term of uh, dropping certain you know, neural connectivity um, at random to reduce um, or, or memorizing the patterns. Okay, so then we are adding um, the neuromodulatory uh, you know, modulating spared input at different levels. So for example, at the local level, this is uh, something spared actually by the Miconi paper. We're adding a heavy um, plasticity term in the weight updates. So this is within the LSTM unit. And at a local scale uh, for this fully connected layer, we are adding adaptive dropout probability comp com computed based on current loss values. And for the whole network, we are having a learning rescheduling. So we are having this learning rescheduling based on the behavior of, uh, of, uh, of, of mice or rats. Because when they're first, as I said, when they're first introduced to environment, they're more nervous and more willing to learn and they're learning at a faster pace. And then after they learn a bit about the environment, they're more relaxed and they wanted to um, kind of take a break. So we have a learning rescheduling based on that. And of course, these represent self-modulation at the network level, um, indicated by the learning scheduling and as well connectivity level. For example, we have having connect uh, plasticity as well as a dropout plot probability. So, um, so far, so we are adding, of course, we are adding these levels of modulation one by one to observe what they are giving us individually and also, you know, in combination. That's why we're having around four or five, four or five different mo model variants in this study. Okay, so yeah, so um, for the five variants we study in this study, so the base model is a Mikon, uh, no, no, sorry, it's a, it's a, the model um, partly inspired by the Benino paper, and then we add the Hebbian connectivity, and for the third version of the model, we have Hebbian plasticity plus um, um, the dropout, uh, adaptive dropout, and after that, we have uh, added the two different learning rates um, because we are we wanted to explore how this affects the way the model learns. So um, these are the results we currently have. So we have the loss curve and also the aerofambulation curve. So from the loss, we can see that we have a faster convergence. We are introduced in different model versions. Uh, for example, if we compare the base model to other models, we can see that at the beginning it's more comparable, but after around 400, 500 epochs, it actually, you know, for the pace model, it plateaued a bit more at around 500 epochs and pretty much it um, keeps at this level until the end of the training. But for all the other versions, including Hebbian and uh, the self-modulated update of uh, dropout probability and learning rate, we can see that the loss continue to improve until the end of uh, the training, which says that the, um, the actual self, uh, cell fairing or cell activity and the predicted ones are closer and closer. So what about if we evaluate this test performance by using the error formulation? So this is the difference between the, uh, the, the, the given trajectory, the ground truth and the predicted trajectory or the location of the, of, of the agent. So we can see that what's interesting about this is that we have actually a faster learning um, at between zero and 200 epochs in all the versions. And this goes well uh, in alignment with the last version of the evaluation. And by the end, we can see that um, the error formulation across the five versions, it's really hard to see the difference here, but actually there is a numerical difference across the five versions. And we have seen continuous improvement by adding all these modern com com components. And we see that the base model actually um, achieved around um, uh, uh, 500, at 500 epochs uh, uh, error formulation that's comparable to what we achieved using the last version of the model where we have dropout, um, adaptive dropout and learning rate at around 50 epochs. That's quite interesting. It means that at the beginning of learning, these neuromodular neuro version are learning significantly faster compared to the base model. So this is something we have observed at a thousand epochs of training. Um, uh, first thing is that we have gradually um, to reduce some loss. And in the meantime, I mean, although loss do not always convert to a smaller error, we still have uh, errors that's reducing until you know, until the end. And uh, we can see that, oh, um, okay, for this, for this task, we can see that um, adding this neuromodular component help, actually helped us to train the models faster as well as to achieve, um, you know, a smaller error by the end of training. So this is the big thing we have observed by adding all these levels of neuromodulation. 
And after that, we wanted to understand what's actually occurring during the first 200 epochs because we have seen a rapid learning during this um, beginning trials. And um, we wanted to understand what's actually happening from a neuronal point of view. Um, the first thing we have solved is that um, at the baseline, there's pretty much a random, random, you know, random trajectory. And at 200 epochs, we are comparing this with the baseline. There's already a big improvement uh, looking at the, the ambulatory track. And this is what we have seen at around 200 epochs in different models. So for example, for the base model, the error is around 0.19 meters. And with, for the model with the hepin plasticity only, it's around 0.70 meters. And for the uh, model with the hepin plasticity and, and a dropout only, it's around 0.12 meters and I think with the learning is around 0 0.11 meters. So we have seen that this constantly improvement um, already demo already kind of uh, showcase itself at the learning phase of learning and uh, especially um, around 200 epochs or within the 200 epochs we have seen a greater difference quantified by the error, error fabulation and we see a greatly um, you know increased uh, increased um, uh, ambulation error in the place in the base model. And the second thing we wanted to understand is what is the underlying cell activities? For example, like in the fully connected layers, where the, the units that are representing or encoding the spatial learning behavior are, are changed during this, um, especially the first 200 epochs. So for this, we wanted to uh, describe the properties of the unit activity in this. So that's why we are um, discussing a bit of a different cell. You know, I'm giving a primer of all this like different cell patterns and, and their activities in the brain. So um, what's, about, what's interesting about this Vanino study initially is that they're the first one to pro propose that um, there are actually biologically plausible behavior occurring at um, the fully connected layer within the neural network. And we are borrowing this as, um, you know, as a benchmark to start with. And we are aware of there are different fairing patterns of cells in the fully connected layers, especially for places like red like and head direction border cells. So for these cells, um, this is something we have seen commonly in animals. For example, when the animals ambulating randomly in a, in a box or in an open environment, we can see that there are regular hexagonal fairing patterns encoded by grid cells. For example, when the animals here or here or here, the, uh, the corresponding grid cells in the brain actually fare like crazy. And uh, then the grid cells, they are projecting the plate cells. And then the plate cell mark a, a, a certain location within the environment. Uh, for example, in our case, so this is our 2.2 meter um, ambulatory field. And you can see that for a plate like cell is marking this uh, searching area as, um, uh, for example, a, a location this cell certainly prefers. And when the animal is at this location, the cell fares like crazy. And uh, there is a direct mapping between grid cell and plate cells. Actually, the, the, there is a theory that the vec vec vector uh, combination of the grid cell is actually mapping to the plate cell. And, um, and there are a lot of theory about why this is happening and still we are trying to answer this question. So the other subtypes are the border cells and, uh, and the head direction cells. So border cell marks the border of, of a certain field. For example, in this field, uh, when the animal is at the border, uh, right side border of this uh, this field, the border cell fare a bit more, and uh, this is in our in our case. So when the animal is at the lower left corner or some somewhere around here, the border cell fare. And in the meantime, there's also head direction cell because we have to know in which direction we are moving. So this is a bit of hard to demonstrate how the cell fare because um, it's only like when we are having we're heading to toward different directions. A cell fairing change. For example, this cell has a preference toward uh, a, a 170 degrees or so. And of course, um, this is how it's demonstrated. And in other cases, it's a bit of hard to see how the fairing looks like for different uh, angles. So there's an angular analysis. I'm not going to describe that in details. And um, uh, if you have any questions regarding how this is done, please just drop me a line. But this is how a direction cell look like in our, in our version. And we wanted to understand how the cells um, activities are evolving, you know, especially during the starting starting epochs of the training. So um, we have something called a grid grid gridness score that's measuring how the cell how hexagonal like pattern the cell is faring. So we have measured the grid score of different cells in different experimental versions. We can see that the grid score of the neurons we have in a fully connected layer 
is actually, you know, changed drastically in between the first um, couple of epochs and up until 300 epochs after that stabilized a bit. And um, it's kind of a comparable until the end. So this is our first operation. And of course, um, what we have seen from these studies is that we have, um, we have a different uh, level of neuromodulation, the grid cell, the initial evolution of the grid cell activity or the gridness of the um, of the, the cells are a bit of different. So this can be significantly um, modified by the protocol we are using. And then we give a deep dive into that. So again, this is the same figure and we wanted to look into how across different number of epochs, the greatness, um, the grid cell distribution, the grid score distribution of the cells have changed. For example, these are two protocols uh, where we have the fully fleshed um, uh, you know, neuromodulation onto the cells into the Habian plasticity plus uh, adaptive dropout and learning rescheduling. And we can see that actually when we have different learning rescheduling, you know, to start with, um, the, the, the initial grid score of the cell is actually having yielding a, a different distribution across the two versions. For example, we can see that um, uh, if, uh, for, for a smaller learning rate, the grid cell scores pick a bit more. And for, our, for a larger learning rate, it's uh, pretty much like there's a wider spread for the grid, cell, grid, grid score distribution at the beginning of the training. So I think this is playing a different, uh, this is playing a role in a way of why the learning trajectory a bit of different in the two first 200 trial, uh, the two first 200 epochs. And uh, the second thing is that we can see that just um, in alignment with the grid score, uh, you know, change across different epochs, we can see that after the first um, 100 epochs, the distribution of grid score is a, uh, is a stayed relatively unchanged and up until the thousand epochs. So this confirms our hypothesis that the uh, animal is actually learning a bit harder at the beginning and uh, it has acquired the fundamentals of, um, of, uh, a, 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 of a cell properties and development at the first 200 trials. And after that, it just greatly, uh, uh, gradually stabilized. And this is why we have a proposal that we should have a, you know, a spatially sometimes asymmetric monitoring of of model performance, especially in the case of neuromodulation, because we may have yield different cup of states and sometimes the model or the agent just learn more, um, you know, hard and compared to other out of time period. And after that, we want to dig into how the cell fairing pattern have changed across the first 200 epochs, especially. So yeah, but come, uh, let's just look into this again. And we have uh, example fairing patterns of all these cell type here kitty taking into account. And by the beginning, um, at epoch zero, this is pretty much like a noisy picture of how the cells are faring. And the cell does not have any preference in this field. And there's no um, clear classification of the cells. And after that, we are evolving a certain pattern of cell faring, especially by already some, uh, by, by around, around 100 epochs and 200 epochs, uh, respectively. For example, we can see that this is more like a border cell. And this is a border cell as well. And this is uh, some uh, primitive grid-like patterns from here and here. And uh, this is uh, like this cell uh, that pr pr prefers a corner, uh, of course, but you can see like at around 200 epochs or 100 epochs, we can already see established cell classification and um, you know, for different classes of cells evolving from, evolving from the, the, the fully connected layer. And this is of course not fully comparable to what we have seen by the end of the training where there is actually a clear pattern of great cell the greatness as well as the border cell preferences and stuff like this. But of course at 200 epochs, we can already pretty much prototyping this classification and tell which this cell will, 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 will be like by the end of uh, the training. So this is something quite interesting. It also demonstrate that the learning is a bit of asymmetric and it occurred a lot by the beginning. So if we only plot this by a thousand epochs and say we, at the end, we, of course we have a small error by the of, of emulation. We will never know what's happening in between. And uh, there's actually a faster evolution of cell faring patterns at the beginning. Okay, so um, we also wanted to know what um, of our new modulation brings to this to all these cell fairing patterns, and we so for this we wanted to identify the multiple classes of neurons and do a count and percentage of how these cell proportions have shifted when we are applying different new modulation at different levels. And in the meantime, we may also have observed a couple of different property change for um, different classes of neurons. And in our case, when we are having a neuromodulated neuromod version of the model implemented, we can see uh, there's actually a greater percentage of place-like place -like cells and a decrease of grid-like cells. 
we will, as a next step, of course, look into how the cell proportion is, uh, is distributed in the real brain and if we can kind of enable a one-to-one -one projection from, from, from this certain cell class of how that affects our model. And in the meantime, uh, there, are some, uh, there is a slight decrease in the number of head direction cells and a significant decrease in border cells. Um, there are, um, and so currently we are looking into the biological implications of all of these changes. But one take home message from here is that actually adding neuromodulation at different levels can change how the cells, um, you know, how uh, the proportion of different classes of cells and their fairing properties. For example, as you can see, if you compare the base model, you know, um, the, the grid cell fills a hexagonal pattern compared to that to the version where we have uh, all the neuromodulation involved. We can see that actually the, the field of fairing of hexagonal pattern is actually a lot smaller. So that's an interesting observation we have so far. So the take home message of the study is that uh, it's kind of interesting to introduce neuromodulation at different levels to, to see how they are changing the learning and behavior of the, of the neural networks. And in, in the meantime, we may have uh, an asymmetric sampling of behavior as we have discussed before. And of course, um, this is something we, we uh, we think that's important to address in future studies because essentially the learning can be at different pace at different phases of uh, of uh, of a whole trajectory. And in the meantime, it's important to develop task specific measures. For example, witness score and uh, to measure how the cells um, have uh, the cell activity have changed when they're, they're introduced in different protocols. And in the meantime, as laws do not always map to um, a greater model performance, we wanted to use other. Um, measures, for example, the average emulation to understand how, you know, the model performance and the end results are changing. They're adding, they're having different protocols. So I think that's more or less the things I wanted to discuss. And I want to thank these people for um, uh, being collaborative and supporting these studies. And uh, and I have worked with the cognitive neuroscience and artificial intelligence lab at Western and a cognitive neurophysiology lab at Robus, where we have the animal data coming in. And we collaborate with the Shree's lab um, at Newcastle. And this study has been supported by multiple funding agencies and institutions in Canada. And I want to thank them for their support. So if you have any questions, um, I know this is a lot of uh, great details we have covered today. And it's, uh, it's hard to kind of uh, leave a more compact form presentation because there are a lot of things I want to discuss and present. So if you have any questions regarding the results or the uh, kind of uh, the protocol of the study and how we did all these experiments, just let me know. Uh, you can, uh, can reach out to me on Twitter or by email. So um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much. That's it. Thanks, mate. That was great. Uh, I really like the, what I call the framework pictures, those big picture, uh, you know, scaffold where you tie in all the detailed properties of neuromodulators and detailed aspects of kind of deep learning experimentation and so on. And, and then to see the experiments, which I hadn't seen before, uh, showing that sort of layering these neuromodulatory principles can actually successfully improve grid cell formation. I think that really ties in well with what Srikanth's point was earlier, how these things sort of work in combination. Um, so I do have uh, more specific questions and uh, just on the chat, it also says, you know, amazing slides, May, such a great summary of so many research papers and concepts. So uh, that, that was really great. You covered a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. In the interest of time, I, um, I think maybe let's move to Thomas and then we'll get to some more specific questions because I think much of Thomas's stuff is very adjacent to some of the experiments you, you showed as well. Exactly, so maybe nice exactly. To kind of do them together. Yeah, especially yeah. The, for the heavy and plasticity part. Um, uh, yeah. So Thomas proposed this framework, uh, I think two years ago, and we just, um, we changed it somehow in our, in our version, but we were like largely inspired by that. Yeah, and I think Thomas has a, really like better and more detailed presentation than I do on this part. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks me. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, Thomas, do you wanna share your screen? Sure, and gonna, yeah, while that. you're setting up, let me quickly introduce you. Oh, yeah, sure. uh, yeah, so Thomas is a member from ML Collective. His main research focuses on nature inspired approaches to AI, especially neuroscience inspired techniques and evolutionary algorithms. But his recent projects also cover extensions of back propagation algorithms to networks with plastic connections and variable structure, biologically plausible learning in recurrent neural networks, and also mechanistic models of visual attention and visual search in the primate brain. Thomas is currently searching for a job, so feel free to connect with him after this meetup. And he's also no stranger to Numenta, as he was a visiting research scientist back in 2017. He also presented at one of our, um, I think our third brain that they meet up on heavy and learning, and that's back in 2019. 
So we're really happy to have you back here again. Hi. And as kind of May kind of uh, alluded to, I think you're one of the few re researchers who are actually really seriously looking at neuromodulation and the AI and how it can impact AI. So definitely encourage reaching out to Thomas. Uh, sure. Uh, okay, let me start this presentation. Uh, yeah, is it working? Yeah. Awesome, perfect. Okay, well, thanks, thanks a lot for having me here. It's great to be back at a new Brains at Bay meeting. Uh, in, so in the last two talks, we've learned a lot about how neuromodulation actually works in the brain and how it can be applied to different artificial models. Here, I'm going to show an example of how neuromodulation, or more precisely, a very specific type of neuromodulation, can be applied to artificial neural networks to enhance their learning abilities. And so this project starts from an observation, which is that animals can do something which is pretty nice, which is that they can automatically learn novel cognitive tasks, by which I mean they can learn automatically that is, they don't have an external learning algorithm uh, training them. They don't run by backprop or gradient descent. They have their own internal machinery, which allows them to learn pretty complicated things. They can learn novel tasks. That is, they can learn tasks that they have never seen before in their life, or even in some case, in their evolution. I'm going to show an example in a moment. But more importantly, they can learn cognitive tasks. That is, animals don't just learn simple stimulus response associations, stimulus reflexes, like if you see this, do that. But they can learn more complicated tasks in which they need to discover, memorize, and make use of a certain piece of information for every new instance of the task, or in short, tasks that require working memory. And that's what we're interested in in this project. Now, this ability of animals to learn uh, cognitive, learning-based, memory-dependent tasks, it's been studied for quite a while in animal psychology. Uh, the classical example is the task by Harlow and uh, colleagues from 1949, in which they train monkeys to learn how to discover which of two objects uh, is associated with food. That is, you repeatedly show two different objects to the monkey, such that only one of them has the food at always the same time each time. And so the monkey must find out over the course of successive trials which of the two objects has the food by trial and error. And you do that with six successive trials. And then after six trials, you pick two completely different objects and you do it again. So every time, the monkey must find out through trial and error which of the two objects is associated with the food. And so here in the middle, you see the, the performance of the monkey as time goes by. Initially, you see that the monkey does pick out which of the two objects is associated with the food, but it's not very good. It makes a lot of mistakes. But as time goes by, and as it goes, as it goes through more and more episodes, uh, it gets better and better at the task until by the end, at the Thomas curve here, the monkey only needs one single trail to determine exactly which of the two objects has the food. And after that, it's nearly perfect performance. In other words, Simply by being exposed to many episodes of the task, uh, the monkey has learned the structure of the task. That is, it has learned how to identify, memorize, and exploit the relevant piece of information for this task, namely the identity of the food rewarded object. Now, there are many other examples of learning based, memory guided tasks in the literature. Uh, one example that is quite interesting is those recent studies in which they have mice uh, learning memory guided navigation. But, yeah, mice learning memory guided uh, navigation in virtual reality. That is a project a virtual reality maze on a screen and the mouse has to navigate through that and perform a memory guided uh, navigation task in this virtual maze. Now, clearly no task, no mouse has ever performed this task in the evolution of mice, I think. And yet the mice can learn this task pretty well, which shows that they can really learn truly novel tasks that they have not seen before during their evolution. And again, those are mice, not primates. So there's quite a range of animals who can do those memory, can learn those novel memory guided tasks. Now, uh, this ability of animals to learn those uh, cognitive memory guided tasks, it, 
recently there's been quite a lot of interest in, uh, from artificial intelligence researcher and in artificial intelligence it tends to be called meta learning again learning how to learn and so recently there have been many studies on this subject i'm just showing a few examples here but there are many more and they all propose many different methods for solving this problem but they all share a common structure a common general organization which is that um, you have the agent you know the artificial agent performing the task performing one episode of the task here yeah, that will be the six trials of one episode with uh, the same objects and the same object being substituted foot so during that it performs the task and then between episodes you optimize the, the learner so that it gets better and better over successive episodes of the task. In other words, you have two learning loops at different levels embedded into each other. The terminology is that you have the inner loop that is within episode learning during which the, uh, the monkey, uh, sorry, the agent performs the task. It learns when it needs to learn to perform the task. Here, that would be the identity of the rewarded objects. And then between episodes, you have an outer loop of learning during which an external alg algorithm optimizes the agent in order to get better during the inner loop. Again, there are many methods, but they all share this common organization. Now here, already we can see a difference between what happens in meta-learning in artificial systems and what happens in animals, which is that in animals, you also have this outer loop supposedly, but while the monkeys, the, the actual monkey performs in our learning with its own working memory. The outer loop, the improvement, the, yeah, the, optimi the optimization of the system, it doesn't occur through an external algorithm. It doesn't occur through backprop or gradient descent. It occurs through the internal machinery of the, of the brain. That is, the brain comes with a self-modifying abilities based on plasticity, on rewards-based neuromodulation, on its innate connectivity as well which allows it to automatically learn the task and to automatically get better and better simply through exposure to stimuli and rewards alone at performing this memory-guided task. Now, this ability, this internal machinery, it did not appear by magic. It was evolved. That is, evolution has carefully optimized uh, the innate structure of the brain in order to undo it with the adequate levels and amounts and organization of connectivity, plasticity, neuromodulation, etc., so that when exposed to a new novel task and just stimuli and rewards from this task, animals can actually learn to perform those tasks just from stimuli and rewards alone. So in addition to those two learning loops, there is a third loop, the evolutionary loop, which optimizes the whole thing and allows it to learn automatically. That's exactly what I'm trying to do here. The goal is to evolve a self-contained plastic network that can automatically acquire novel cognitive behaviors just from stimuli and rewards alone, exactly like a little lab rat would. In other words, I want to evolve my own little lab rat. So how are we going to do that? The model that we're going to use, the type of network that we're going to use, is a simple recurrent neural network. That is, it's not like the deep uh, multi-layer neural networks that May was showing uh, beforehand. It's just a set of fully connected neurons, which receive stimuli and also reward information and produce responses by the activity of their neurons. Now, an additional subtlety is that the connections between those uh, neurons, they come with an innate, an innate weight but it's a standard normal neural network weights as in classical neural networks. But in addition to that, every connection also has a certain amount of plasticity. That is for each connection, there's both an innate weight and a certain amount of plasticity. The plasticity determines how much the connection is going to change over the lifetime of the agent as a result of rewards and stimuli and et cetera. Now, some connections are going to be very plastic. And they're going to change a lot as a result of exposure to stimuli and rewards. Others are not going to be very plastic at all. They're going to have very low plasticity and remain constant and fixed at their innate weight. And evolution is going to play on those two parameters for each connection. Those are the two structural parameters of the network, which evolution will optimize 
to endow the network with automatic learning abilities, hopefully. When I say plasticity, what do I mean exactly? That's where the neural modulation comes in. The plasticity rule that I'm going to use is a rule called node perturbation. Uh, it's a simple, uh, descriptive, but effective model of the activity of dopamine on synaptic plasticity, on heavy and synaptic plasticity. It's been applied to learn many different things, um, including uh, learning of songs in songbirds, learning of movement and reaching in uh, models of the human arm, many different tasks. It's quite simple. The way it works is that you apply random perturbations to the activations of the various neurons, and then you apply a certain plasticity rule, a reward modulated plasticity rule, which works like this. That is, the weight between any two neurons, I and J, is modified by the product of the activity of the input neurons times the perturbation in the output neuron multiplied by the reward. So technically, it's a simple reward modulated Hebian learning rule, input times output. But the difference is that instead of using the full activity of the output neuron, we just use the perturbation. That's a crucial element that makes uh, the rule quite e e efficient. I'm happy to talk about it later. So this is, we have this simple reward modulated Hebian uh, learning rule and an additional subtlety in our model is that the change in the connection is also affected by the evolutionary plasticity of the connection. That is, uh, how plastic the connection <laughs> is as determined by evolution again. Again, connections that have very high P parameter, connections that are very plastic are going to change a lot as an effect of rewards and stimuli. Connections that have very low plasticity, again, as determined by evolution, are going to change very little. They're going to remain fixed and constitute, so to speak, the backbone of the overall, the structure of the overall network. Again, hopefully. Now, if we want to evolve an, uh, an agent to be able to learn novel tasks, we need a set of tasks to evolve over. So how are we going to find a sizable set of meta-learning tasks, of learning to learn tasks? For that, we turn to a framework from computational neuroscience, the framework of Young and colleagues, who implemented a lot of tasks from the neuroscience literature, from actual, actual tasks from animal training literature, in a common framework where all the tasks can be implemented more or less in the same manner. That is, all tasks follow the same common pattern where each trial of the task follows the same uh, procedure. For each trial, you first show one stimulus, then there is a delay, then you show a second stimulus, again a delay, and then there is a response period during which you record the response of the, neuro of the network. Once the response has been recorded, you provide a certain reward to the agent. The reward depends on whether or not the response was correct, which is determined, of course, by the task at hand. Different tasks will require different response for any given pair of stimuli. And in addition to that, you also provide a feedback signal to the network to tell it whether it was correct or not uh, for this trial. And you keep repeating that. Now here, because we are quite restricted in terms of computational power, we simplify the framework to only use binary uh, stimuli and binary responses. Uh, so only binary stimuli, binary responses. That gives us a total set of 16 different tasks, like all the possible mappings between uh, two stimuli and two, uh, two possible different responses, which actually cover quite a lot of ground in terms of different tasks. And importantly, one of those tasks is going to be withheld from the, the training set. At least we're going to keep one task that we're never going to show to the agent during evolution. And then periodically, we're going to test the agent on how well it can learn this task that it has never seen before during evolution, because that's what we're really interested in. Not just the ability to perform certain already seen tasks, but the ability to learn novel cognitive tasks that he has never seen before. So putting it all together, during each episode, the agent is shown two stimuli in succession with delays and produces a response and receives a certain reward, which affects the neural modulation, as explained in the rule that I talked about earlier. 
And so some neuromodulation is applied. Neuromodulation plasticity is applied to the network, um, as explained before. And you repeat that 400 times for with 400 trials of the same task. Different stimuli each time, but always the same task. And so the agent is never told which task is doing exactly. It just has to learn what's, what it's supposed to answer for any pair of stimuli just from its own machinery and um, plasticity. Now, so far, what I'm showing here is exactly the same structure as a typical meta learning experiment. You have the inner loop during each episode, and then you have an outer loop where between episodes, the agent is optimized to perform better and better. Except that it, the agent is not really optimized. It's following its own internal machinery to modify itself. And why would this result in proper learning? Because there is a third loop, the evolutionary loop, which will optimize the structure of the agents the innate weights, the plasticity coefficient of each connection, in order to ensure that simple blind neuromodulated plasticity being applied between each episode will result in proper efficient learning of any given task that you might show to it. That's how it's going to work. Uh, again, just to be, just to help a bit seeing things. We have three different loops, the inner loop during each episode, the task loop, of multiple episodes during which you learn a certain task. And then we have the overall uh, outermost loop, the evolutionary loop, during which you learn task learning ability, learning the ability to learn any kind of new tasks. That's what we're really interested in. That's the property that we want to see emerge, the ability to learn novel cognitive tasks just from stimuli and rewards alone. So what results do we get if we apply this? Again, uh, to evaluate the performance of the system, we have a withheld test task that is never used during evolution. And we're going to periodically test the agents on 400 successive trials of this task to see how well it's able to learn it. But the test task that we're going to use, that is the withheld task, is the so-called delayed match to sample task. That is, very simply, are those two successive stimuli the same or are they different? That is, are they all both one or both zero, or are they different? Uh, the reason why we're choosing this specific task as the test task is first, because it's the most challenging of the whole set. And second, because this task is actually used in uh, actual neuroscience studies. So it does have some biological relevance. So what do we get as results? So the short answer is that fortunately it works. And we're quite happy with that. Uh, here, each data point represents the performance of the agent in learning one task. That is, each uh, data point is the performance of the 400 trials of a single task. In blue, you have the training performance. That is, the performance of the tasks that are being used for evolution. That's literally the evolutionary curve here. So it learns pretty easily and pretty well, of course, because those are the tasks from the evolutionary training set. What's really interesting is the red curve here, the actual tests. The performance on this test that it has never seen before during evolution, the delayed match to sample task. We see that initially, at initially when the network has been randomly initialized, even though all the connections are plastic, even though it does follow this reward modulated plasticity, it cannot learn the task. Of course it can't. It doesn't have the structure to turn this blind uh, plasticity into efficient learning. But as time goes by, over generations, and as the agent is exposed to more different tasks and goes through this process of learning and optim evolutionary optimization, slowly it acquires task learning abilities until eventually near the end, it manages to learn the task pretty well, even though, again, it has never seen it before during its actual evolution. Another way to see the performance of the network is to look at the performance during each uh, episode, that is during the 400 trials of a task, which I'm going to show now. Now here, each of those graphs represents the performance of the agent of the 400 successive trials of the same task. Again, both of those are for the test task, the withheld task that is not used for evolution. Um, yeah, the performance is average over eight runs. Now, at generation zero, that is when the network is randomly initialized, even though all connections have 
plasticity and uh, reward modulation and neural modulation, we see that the agent is completely unable to learn the task. That is, it goes through 400 trials of the task. Every time it receives rewards, and every time the random the neural modulation and the plasticity are applied, and it still doesn't learn anything. Of course, it doesn't because again, it's not a trivial task, and this structure does not allow it to convert those rewards and those stimuli into proper efficient learning. But after evolution has done its job, after a lot of generations and lifetimes, now the agent is able to learn this task, which again, it has not seen before during its evolution. Like for the first few trials, it doesn't quite know what to do, but as it goes through more and more trials of the task, and that is receives more rewards and is exposed to more examples of the task, it learns it pretty well. In this system, it's not possible to reach another person because of the random perturbations to activations, so, uh, which ensure exploration. But still, it managed to learn the test pretty well and almost as well as the tests that were actually part of the training set. In other words, the network has evolved the ability to learn automatically a novel cognitive task that it has never seen before, just from the operation of its own evolved machinery. Um, here I'm showing two different controls to make sure that two uh, safety tests. First, I try what happens when I use a different task as a withheld task. Uh, that is, instead of using delayed match to sample, I use the logical NAND between the two stimuli. And we see that it works even better because, again, as I said, uh, the delayed match to sample is easily the most challenging task of the whole set. Uh, another uh, control that we want to use is, uh, do we actually need the plasticity? I mean, it's not uh, a silly question because there are many studies in uh, meta-learning that do not make use of plasticity and still agents are able to learn reasonably complex tasks. Here, it's very unlikely that will be the case because the learning will have to extend over 400 trials each of a whole second long uh, just by storing things in the recurrent activations, which is extremely unlikely. But just to be sure, I tried. So this is the result of the exact same thing as before, uh, but without the plasticity, disabling the reward modulated plasticity and just having evolution sculpting the innate connection of the network. And it doesn't learn anything at all. But no, sorry. It doesn't acquire successful task learning abilities. That is, after 500 generations, it's still as bad as, as the beginning. So this is an important control because it tells us that all three uh, memory systems, the recurrence, the evolution, and the plasticity are all important for this thing to work. So in conclusion, we've shown that evolution can design self-contained plastic networks that can automatically learn novel cognitive tasks. In other words, we have successfully evolved our little lab rats. Now, we have shown that all three learning and memory systems, that is evolution, network recurrence, and neuromodulation and plasticity are required for the system to work. Now, one good thing about this system is that what I showed you is very much a preliminary, an initial project, an initial version of the project. There are many possible ways in which you could improve it and make it both more powerful and more interesting. But the obvious thing it would be to have more complex and biologically relevant tasks, which is just implement the actual original task from the young framework. Uh, you could put the neuromodulation under control of the network itself, as in the paper that May was talking about. You could also, this is maybe a bit more esoteric, but you could add another loop between those three loops and the fourth loop in the system, namely the lifetime loop. That is, have multiple tasks during each lifetime and see how well it does continual learning during each lifetime. That is, how much, how well it can. Um, learn new tasks without forgetting the old ones, and if possible, by having some forward transfer uh, between the tasks. Again, that's a bit esoteric. I'm happy to talk about it later. So in other words, the system worked, and we're quite happy to have evolved our self-contained, automatically learning system that can learn novel cognitive tasks. That concludes my talk. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thanks, Thomas. Fantastic. Thank I really liked how you framed the, the, the contrast between meta learning and the, the sort of innately motivated inner, inner loops. Uh, that was it, great. It's complicated pretty fast. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I like to think about those uh, 
embedded loops and to think systematically and carefully about them because it gives us a certain handle on the complexity of learning at multiple different levels. And uh, it, I think I think it makes it easier to think about those things. Yeah, that's right. It's nice to think about them in a very structured way. And also, you know, thinking about the previous talks, we can now start to ask, you know, how do the different neuromodulators and specific properties in addition to what you've shown, how, how can we start layering those in and, and uh, have an impact? And um, it was also nice that you broke down the learning rule into those different components. Uh, that to me paralleled a lot of what May was doing with several different components, each of which seems to be required uh, in here. Um, I, I think there's one specific question for you that was in the discussion, um, you know, how is P determined? Um, right. I think it's determined through the evolution automatically. Yes, but, uh, yes. Yeah, but the P and the Ws are both the, they're the genome, essentially. They're the genome of the agent. That's what evolution optimizes to ensure proper efficient learning during each new task that the agent sees. So yeah, yeah. P and W are the genes. That was okay. enabled. Great, thanks. You know, kind of sort of stepping back into more, more of the discussion and, and for all of you, um, you know, as I'm kind of listening to you guys, um, the sort of, I'd like to make sort of a very broad comment about how we could think about neuromodulators uh, in general and AI. Um, so I kind of think of deep learning as networks as being fairly static. Um, you know, networks learn to map specific inputs to specific outputs, and that's about it. You know, as you showed that acquiring these novel tasks are pretty difficult. I mean, there are recurrent networks, but they're also pretty static. But then when you want to put these networks into real applications like robotics or self-driving cars, then you have to write a lot of outer loops to kind of manage everything properly um, because essentially the network itself is pretty static. With neuromodulators though, it seems like we're getting a very different picture. You know, you know very broadly speaking, you know, neuromodulators can regulate plasticity in a number of different ways. It can regulate overall brain state. Uh, you know, optimize hyperparameters on the fly, optimize for novel tasks, you know, control experimentation and foraging. I mean, you kind of mentioned that a little bit in the review paper, but we didn't get into that today. So it seems like, you know, and also the impact of neuromodulators can be very context specific, specific to cell types, operate at different time scales and spatial scales. So is it, you know, the picture I'm getting, neuromodulators may be one of the key mechanisms biology, biology has developed that sort of makes humans and animals really dynamic, flexible, functioning, autonomous agents. Um, do you guys want to comment on that? Is this is a very sort of big picture way of, of thinking about it? And is that completely out of whack? Does that make sense to you? Um, you know, uh, if, if you guys can comment on that, that'd be great. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to go first here. So um, actually, um, this very much encapsulates what Corey Bargman said once at a conference I was at. So uh, she said that um, neuromodulators are the way uh, to reconfigure a set of instructions into a set of options. Hmm. Um, so what these neuromodulators are essentially doing uh, is, to, is, to, is to write upon um, um, a hardwired circuit diagram and, 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 and to really nudge uh, these neurons and synapses uh, to dynamically reconfigure depending on, on contextual demand. Um, and I think this is what these neuromodulators um, really are doing all the time uh, in that they're constantly reconfiguring a set of hardwired instructions uh, into a set of dynamic options. Hmm. Um, and um, in, in, in some sense, I think the deep layer, the, the deep network architecture is very well suited to exploit this um, biological yeah. organizing principle um, because, um, I mean, the, the, the deeper your, your network is, then I believe there are more options, for example, for a layer of neuromodulation to try and, and build upon. To, to really try and get this uh, deep network to do a lot of things, uh, to, to reconfigure um, these layers into doing uh, a myriad different things. Um, so, so to me, uh, clearly, um, yes, um, these neuromodulators are um, kind of the, 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 the cherry on the cake, 
if I may, because they're really exploiting a hardwired circuit diagram um, to carve out options that, that they could then try and fill the cracks and, and, and get the whole network uh, do something uh, depending on, on, on behavioral and, and environmental context. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to be, maybe it's even more than the cherry. It seems to be essential in some way. I, I, I mean, maybe May or, or Thomas, you guys can think, I mean, it, it, can we even imagine dynamic systems autonomously behaving without these principles at play? Uh, yeah, I, I really like uh, what Srikant was saying about the idea of reconfiguring into different modes. Like, uh, mm. Shrikant has shown how there are many different types of neural modulators and different sources of neural modulation. But actually, when you compare the number and source of neural modulators to the immense number of neurons, areas, uh, columns, I mean, it's not that high a number. It's relatively low dimensional. Like dopamine, for example, recently there have been studies which have shown that there are different types of dopamine neurons. But it's not that large number. Many you can classify dopamine neurons into a relatively constrained set of classes, which have very uh, similar response properties uh, within each class, and which, on top of that, tend to target this, uh, the same areas in a relatively diffuse manner. So it's, it's pretty, it seems to be that neuromodulation, even though its effects are still largely mysterious and complex and difficult to. Uh, Untangle. It seems to be, as we can say, a kind of low-dimensional reconfiguring uh, si system into each of different modes, uh, mm -hmm. depending on what exactly you're trying to do here. Uh, yeah. So yeah, th that's one interesting added degree of flexibility and maybe a way to, what to say, to tame, so to speak, the enormous diversity and complexity of uh, of the whole brain. And to guide it and to canalize it, to speak into uh, a certain specific predefined, evolutionarily defined set of uh, behaviors and uh, self-modification, depending on the circumstances of, in which you're finding yourself. So yeah, I really like the yeah. sort of reconfiguration. So um, I actually have a couple of points to add. And the first thing is that um, like the studies we have described, especially like the review, uh, review papers that have done this artificial demodulation in neural networks. Um, the thing I wanted to say is that um, these are of, of course, regardless of if that's a new modularity network or a general like deep neural network, we can see that there are really small, you know, um, like number of neurons and mostly hundreds or, of them. And actually in the biological brain, the modularity is a bit of a built-in, for example, in the um, brain stem or in the spinal cord, there are different classes of neurons that are encoding for a different speed. And uh, so there's actually one eLife article on this about the different, uh, you know, uh, topological organizations of uh, brain stem neurons that are encoding different speed and animal can just uh, switch between uh, uh, encoding of speed by, by having a, a different excitability of these class of neurons. So this is one thing. And in the meantime, uh, noradrenaline also classically considered as something that's having a kind of a homo homogeneous representation of, uh, of uh, neurons and mapping onto different you know, the same cluster of neurons. And now there are studies actually by the uh, Johansson lab at Liken uh, in Japan. And they, are, uh, they have found that the, uh, there are cell class specific projections from the neurodermal systems in the, in the, in the, in the, in the subcortical area. And uh, these are cells that are controlling not only the fear conditioning, but also uh, tactile stimuli presentation and also uh, tactile processing. So these are built-in modularities in the biological systems. And of course, we have, uh, of course, these neuromodulator systems that are integrating or uh, innervating different populations. And this is built-in modularity to me. And of course, like in the, you know, the modular network, the modularity is a, a way that has been suggested to address a continual learning problem quite well, um, according to many studies. And this is, um, I think this, there's also a, re a really nice review paper. I can provide a link to that as well. Um, but uh, so far, we have only tested uh, modularity in a kind of a mechanic way. And uh, we have the same neural population that we have kind of a, a manually designed you know, modular network. And it's gonna be quite interesting to see how this can be learned or 
uh, uh, the adaptive way. So this is my first comment. I think uh, we have a lot of lessons to learn from the brain in regards of uh, this kind of uh, cell specific projections of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of neurons and new modulators, as well as the uh, different ways that are they are, they are making a contact. So the second thing I have uh, that I, I think uh, what Thomas did is, is quite interesting. And Shri and I, we have recently discussed also like maybe a new study in a way that featuring different evolutionary mechanisms, for example, like some examples we said are really inspired by fundamental organisms, like for example, central pattern generator in, in lampreys or, or uh, uh, this uh, lower order organisms as we can think of, and uh, in lampreys or crustaceans, you know, this is that uh, Mother did a lot of experiments on quotations, um, uh, neural networks and how the neural modulators play a role in regulating them. But in humans and primates and uh, like rodents, we have kind of a higher order of functions, for example, social cognition and uh, uh, execution of um, like movements of high dexterity. Uh, and also some other like things that we have recently evolved as human beings. I think it's quite interesting to understand what are the organi organization of uh, neuromodular systems in different species across time? This has to do a lot with the evolution of, uh, evolution of perspective. So for example, um, one example is that uh, in Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease, these are, these are like really highly modulated by neurons in stridum and uh, the basal ganglia. So we have uh, uh, imbalance in, in, in dopaminergic system and cholinergic systems in this certain area as inducing a lot of uh, behavioral problems. So this is something that's really specifically restricted to human, I think, uh, like apart from the movement perspective, like uh, by movement disorders like Parkinson's. So um, we maybe it might be interesting to see if we can kind of introduce this kind of different evolution and directions, um, you know, not only towards movement and, and uh, the navigation or pattern association, but also towards you know, social cognition or something alike. So this is one of the research uh, focus of uh, actually computational psychiatry. I think we have a currently interest in that. So I think this is gonna be quite interesting to maybe like already to talk to Thomas regarding like we can kind of think of something to evolve different evolutionary mechanisms by introducing different parameters or stuff like that. And it's gonna be quite an interesting story, you know, if we kind of think of the evolutionary trajectories of different, of different species, yeah. Mm -hmm. So multiple agents maybe uh, cooperating and yeah, working exactly. together. So, and some, yeah. um, I think uh, Guillaume Dumas at uh, University of Montreal, he studies uh, social cognition of multi-agent um, interactions in, in human agents and, and uh, AI agents. That's a quite interesting read. And he's also an expert on autism. So it might hmm. be interesting to kind of uh, his work might be of relevance when it comes to that. Yeah. So going to sort of the first uh, the first part of what you said and, and tying also to what Thomas and Shikan said about this modularity and having a relatively low number of uh, uh, neurons that are involved in this. And I think this relates to some of the, the questions in the Q&A as well. Um, so there may be a small number of modules or a relatively low number of cells, which is good. That means we, it's more tractable in some sense, at least from a coding standpoint. But Something that Sri mentioned is that it's not just these individual things, it's, it's the interactions between them are incredibly important. Um, so maybe you guys can elaborate on that. And I think the experiments also kind of highlighted that and the questions that are kind of there in the, in the Q&A, you know, is there a cascading set of reactions that one begets another? Is there a balance between their effects? Um, you know, traditionally people have thought about dopamine in isolation. Uh, but really, should we think about it as in cooperation and opposition with other neuromodulators? Uh, so there are a number of questions in that kind of vein in the thing, which I think it's a pretty important uh, uh, area to think through here. And it makes it actually makes it a little more complicated, unfortunately. Right. So, so indeed, uh, I think this, this uh, cooperation, interaction, even competition, fundamentally interaction uh, is... Is, is a very uh, uh, intriguing organizing principle of neuromodulatory function. Uh, let's, let's just go back um, a step to this whole evolutionary um, a point that was raised, right? So, um, so from, from uh, um, uh, a primitive organism like C. elegans uh, to mouse, to monkey, to man, uh, it seems that a lot of these neuromodulatory systems are actually conserved, right? So like you'll find mm. dopaminergic release or cholinergic release in C. elegans, 
as you do in mouse, um, um, uh, monkey, and and human brains. But I think as as you you um, um, uh, uh, climb the echelons of evolutionary complexity, um, uh, I mean the fact that there are a lot more neurons and with a lot more neurons and, and increased axons and dendrites, there are also a lot more synaptic interactions. Um, this seems to suggest that um, um, the, the combinations of brain states that these neuromodulators could exploit is also immensely greater, right? So in some sense, um, um, the, the function of these neuromodulators is dictating brain state. But on the other hand, to get to a certain state, the brain is constantly asking neuromodulatory systems um, uh, to, to release whatever neuromodulator to get to a certain state, right? So it's very synergistic in some sense. And it's never going to be just with one neuromodulator mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. that there's that, that there's some kind of a relay race or some kind of a tug of war. It's always um, an interaction which could be cooperation or competition um, that's uh, setting the stage. But of course, um, it's easier said than done because characterizing, quantifying these interactions is, is uh, definitely uh, not something that's trivial. Perhaps we should start with some kind of an invertebrate to try and understand these interactions first. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so perhaps we try and get an appreciation for some uh, primordial principles of organization um, and then maybe um, um, uh, go bigger and, and try and study these interactions uh, in, in the mammalian brain. Yes. Yeah, I mean, how do you even think about doing these experiments? I mean, that there's well, just such a wide field of them. <laughs> well, one thing is that um, Shrikant was mentioning many different animals like C. elegans. Uh, even in insects, in crickets, like people have studied those neuromodulators and you see analogs, like not exactly, but virtually the same chemicals being used in reasonably similar roles in crickets, in insects. Mm. There's a whole series of nature paper from the lab of uh, Gilles Laurent. Uh, you can probably look it up online, but yeah, so it's very, very general. Uh, that being said, of course, crickets are not humans or rats or primates. And uh, as Shrikans was, and uh, as May was saying, yeah, the different evolutionary pressures on different types of animals would of course produce uh, many different behaviors. Another aspect is that Shrikant was talking about the high level combination between uh, the effects of those uh, various neuromodulators, but even at a very low level, like there's still a lot that's mysterious. I mean, the way I understand it, we're still not quite sure what exactly dopamine or even acetylcholine do to an actual neuron when, when they're being applied to it in vivo, in the brain, like in actual uh, circumstances where they're actually working. Uh, so yeah, you have those two uh, levels at which really there's still a lot to learn. And um, I think uh, yeah, computational studies do have a role to play on both. So I think it's important to remember that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it seems yeah. like, go ahead, May. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. No, Thank no, no. Go ahead. So um, to continue, like the po the, the point Thomas discussed, and I actually mentioned the one of the studies that there's a morphological modification on the dendritic spines uh, by the nerdic neurons. There's a mm -hmm. study by done by I cannot remember the name. So it's a like Yamashita or something. Uh, 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 Haruoka science lab. Sorry. Uh, Haruoka science. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I really have issues with Japanese names. I'm sorry. So uh, so they recently found about this in 2014 after. Uh, the development of uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, um, optogenetic tools. So, of course, in the future, we have more tools to really differentiate across the, the different neurological layers. We'll have more observations. So, this is really you know something that's uh, recently occurring a bit more. And also, there are other techniques like two photon imaging and caging uh, in parallel with that, and also a lot of a transgenetic 
uh, transgenic uh, mouse lines, and these are always like there are always new things to find about uh, neuromodulatory, you know, in, in this context. And also, I think there's a, a paper by Krishmar in 2013 or something. They found a region in the brain that's really like on the basilar floor of the brain. That's uh, it's innervated by all five big five neuromodulators, but they all know like there are five neuromodulators. They don't know what exactly each one's uh, uh, each one's doing in that field. So uh, it's quite interesting. And also, you know, when it comes to species, there are some preserved neuromodulators affecting different species. For example, for the mo modern paper, she um, like she used um, a serotonin and and dopamine, but for crustaceans, there are like other neuromodulators like uh, proctolin and uh, there's a, a pi pilo pilocarpin. Like these two neuromodulators that are not so much found in other me mechanisms and, and, and uh, for example, primates and, and humans. So of course, there's a, a kind of a, a generalizability of uh, the basic neuromodulators in each species, but of course we have a bit of a variance across. So maybe we can find, you know, like functional counterparts, but not always the same. So I think this is something that's quite interesting. This allows us to really like use a different, you know, evolutionary properties and neuromodulatory properties of different species to achieve different goals. If you have a different modeling organism. So that's a quite interesting uh, aspect for yeah. me as well. Fantastic. Uh, so I, I wish we had more time to continue the live discussion, uh, but I think what we're going to, there's still a lot of good questions and I'm sure people have lots more questions as well. Uh, so I think Charmaine will set up a post in our HTM forum. We'll post the link uh, to the YouTube uh, description and on, on Twitter so that you can, people can ask more questions and continue the, the discourse. But it's been wonderful having you guys here. Thank you so much for uh, spending two hours with us and thanks for all the great work you're doing. To me, it seems like uh, this is an essential component of AI. It's not, it's not an optional thing. Uh, the fact that it's actually preserved across this wide range of species, I, I didn't really realize that uh, before, but um, you know, it, it's, it's a loss if we don't consider uh, this in more detail in AI, in my opinion. But thank you again uh, for participating. This was a really fantastic set of uh, talks and the uh, perfect uh, three people to, to discuss this topic. Sure, yeah, it was, it was wonderful. Thank you so much for yeah, inviting I, me. I, mm -hmm. And thank you right. everyone for also joining Brains at Bay. And yeah, I'll just post all the links in the follow-up on the Brains at Bay meetup page. So you'll see it under the events. Yeah, and, and, uh, and people don't hesitate to share this on social media. No, don't be shy. <laughs> um, we will continue the discussion online. Sure, and, and if uh, anyone wants uh, pointers to specific papers and, and stuff, just feel free to reach out. Yeah, of course, we are in the infancy of studying it. And if you have any suggestions or comments or if you're coming from any kind of native fields we're discussing, so like feel free to reach out to us because we are always looking for collaborators from different fields. We really need to kind of uh, join the forces to make it work. And at least uh, there are like so many detailed, you know, scales we wanted to address. It's definitely um, helpful to really talk to people that are from different fields that be interested in this. So like feel free to um, join the, the, the talk and join the, the conversation and, um, potentially discuss the uh, chances to collaborate or work together, together on this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I'll just echo Brandon's uh, chat comment here. Thank you, favorite panel of the year. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> well, it's, it's still April. <laughs> <laughs> the next one will be uh, hard to top, or? Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, thank but, you so uh, much. Thanks, right. Brandon. Yeah. Have a good bye -bye. week, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks, bye. It was, it was amazing. Thanks a lot. Thanks, yeah, bye. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank bye. you, guys. And thanks for the questions. Have a nice one. Bye. Have a good week. Bye.